It's Tom. Uh, if you look through the book of Acts, you will see many times, including in Jesus' ministry, uh, uh, God didn't wait for the apostles or Jesus to finish their sermon. Yeah. He broke in like in Acts 10 and just fell on the people and came upon them. And I've seen this all over the world where I've ministered and traveled. I've had to stop preaching uh, because the people were encountering God in ways that they could not hear me. And on a few occasions, once in the Philippines particularly, I couldn't see the people anymore because the cloud of the glory was so tangible. And I thought it was just from my side. Then they came to me, a Filipina lady uh, who had a paralyzed leg healed. No hands laid on her. The glory came. She said, Rob, you and the whole worship team disappeared. We couldn't see you on the stage. You were hidden in a cloud. And I didn't see the cloud. I, I didn't see the cloud, but I felt the cloud. But she saw it, and I never mentioned anything about a cloud. I knew the cloud of the glory was there. And, and I can tell you, I'm saying that because I'm asking you not to hear this with your brain and analyze. I'm asking you to catch it with your spirit. It's an impartation. And if I have to stop before 10 minutes, I'll be so happy because it will mean I don't need to talk anymore because the purpose of this talk is not to inform you of anything. It's to release an encounter with his glory. And I want to tell you this, that five seconds in his glory is worth 10 hours in the anointing. Because in the glory is all the ingredients of the goodness of God, every dimension necessary for every issue or problem you've got. And I want to say this, that in the glory, if you're in the glory for 10 seconds, 10 minutes, and sometimes I've been in the glory for hours, and I know when the glory comes in different contexts that we've been in, uh, people don't want to leave. When God shook that prison in the Philippines, and there were hardcore prisoners there, and all the doors were open, they could all run, they all stayed. Because the glory was there, and the glory is so beautiful and attractive. And the head jailer about to commit suicide because he knew his boss would be angry because he thought all the prisoners have run away. He found they were all there, and he got saved, and his whole household got saved that night. Because Paul went to the household and preached the gospel. So when the glory comes, everything is easy. That's when the yoke is easy and the burden is light. Not in the anointing, in the glory. Amen? So are you with me now? Can you just lift your hands a little bit and say, okay, Lord, bring it on. I want to encounter that glory realm. Because in that glory, you go home and you realize, oh, that problem, that emotional pain I had, it's gone. When did it go? No one laid hands on me. No, the glory will lift everything that's damaged you. The glory will heal, restore, bring blessings. It will bring financial resources. It will change the way you think. It will do everything. Amen. So here's the thing, that to, to the degree that you know a person, to, that determines the degree to which you can speak accurately on their behalf. Amen? True. Because you know what their values are, you know their ways, and you know the pattern of their life. In the same way, to the degree that you really know the living God, to, that will determine the degree to which you can speak accurately on behalf of the nature of God. And even if God does something you've never seen before, or he does something new, you stay secure because you know that whatever he does, he will always be consistent with the true goodness of his nature. These are the people that will own the planet. These are the people, because the Bible says in the last days, God's saying this, in the last days, those who know their God will do mighty works, mighty exploits, mighty miracles. Not those who go to church, not those who know about God, wow. not those who know their Bible, those who know God. Stack that in. Selah. Those who know God. Paul writes in Galatians 4, Now that you know God, or rather are known by God. You know, we, that's Paul saying, we love God because he first loved us. We know God 
because he knows us. So let me say something that could sound controversial, but it's, it's perfectly revelational. You cannot know God by the anointing. You can know the power of God by the anointing. But you can only know his true nature in the realm of his glory presence. And that's why the problem is people learn about the anointing so they know the power, but they don't know the nature of God. So they use the anointing for miracles, but they misrepresent God. And they promote themselves using the power of God because they don't know the nature of God. You cannot know the God by reading the Bible. I know that's a shock to people. You can read the Bible from page front cover to front back cover a hundred times, and you will not know God. You will know about God, but you will not know God. I don't want to know about Glenda. I want to know her. I know about her, but I much more prefer knowing her. The only way you can know God and do exploits in a way that properly represents him and speaks accurately on his behalf as his ambassador, the only way, and it's so clear in the Bible, the only way is when you come into the presence of his glory. And this house has his presence of glory coming in. But, all to, but to know him more fully, we need glory to increase glory to increase glory. Can you say amen? amen? The biggest problem of the old covenant was simple. The letters of stone brought a ministry of condemnation that caused the glory to fade away. That's why the glory will not come when people are under the law. It will come and then it goes. It fades but through the gift of righteousness, it says we will live in the ever-increasing revelation of God's glory. Amen. Amen. It's meant to, brothers and sisters, increase. So Moses, who has known the anointing, he has miraculously destroyed the gods of Egypt. He has seen God split the Red Sea open. He has seen God do awesome things, but he doesn't know God. So one day he's had enough. One day it comes to all of us. I've had enough of knowing about the anointing, knowing the Bible, maybe a little or lots. I know about God. I talk to some distant being, but I don't know him face to face, friend to friend. Moses said, Lord, show, if, I, if I have found favor with you, show me your glory. And God says, I will cause all my goodness to pass before you. And Moses gets to know face to face the living God. Yeah. This first encounter, God only let him see his back parts. All that means is the afterglow. It wasn't God showing him his backside. It was God walking away from Moses and hiding Moses in a cleft of the rock because he's letting Moses know you're still not in the new covenant, mate. And you can't even look on my face and live because I'm so holy. But later on, Moses gets to look face to face with God. So brilliant was the glory he had to cover his face because he didn't want the Israelites to see the glory fades away because they're not in the new covenant. And they would become worried. Why is God fading away? We know why he fades away. Because of the law. Amen? So the most important thing that our hearts should be beating with is not how to improve our marriage. is not how to improve our finances. is not how to improve our quality of life or mental peace or anything like that. The, the passion that should be panting in our heart, what is the most important thing in eternity and in time, it's to know the living God. Because out of his glory will come a great marriage, finances, healing, health, blessings, evangelism, unsaved people being saved. Can you say amen? 
if we run after the wrong thing, we're like a little dog running after a double-decker bus. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's going to do when he catches the bus. If he gets his teeth into the wheel, he's going to destroy himself. Christians are running for this, running for that. St we need to stop all of that and say, I, like David, I pant, I pant for your glory presence, Lord. And as a result of him going off the glory beyond the glory of God, he, he won 66 wars. He never lost any wars. Israel's boundaries expanded to the fullness of God's promise to Abraham. And David ruled as a king who honored the glory of God. So the most important thing for our city church is to know the glory presence outside of a church service. so that the glory in the church service will keep increasing. Can you say amen? amen? So to know the glory better, first you've got to learn how to attract the glory. God is attracted. Some things attract God and some things repel God. Some things push God away. Like pride, he resists. Yep. But humility attracts the glory. Amen? If you can't attract the glory, you can't get to know God. So we have to be attractors of the glory. We need to put our spiritual makeup on. No, I'm joking. <laughs> we need to have a humility that has gone beyond any previous generation. Wow. And a humility that's exactly at the level of Jesus Christ. The greatest glory flowed through him because of his humility not for any other reason. And he knew his father from the glory in heaven and he experienced the glory when he worked, walked this earth. So how do you attract his glory? Make sure on a daily basis you have this attitude. And I do this every day. Father, reveal to me every area of pride, every area of ego, every area where I sound zealous for you, but it's really my selfish ambition and pride trying to have success to make me look good. That's fraudulent. You're the God of truth. You see through all of those cons. The grace on this church is the people of this house are increasingly freed from the need to impress other people. When people prophesy here or share their testimony or like Ash or many different ones, I've, this is what I've been saying to Sean, nobody is trying to impress anybody. That is why the glory is coming, because the levels of humility. Now, my whole attitude, if I have an attitude of insecurity, if I have an attitude of rejection, I'm saying, Father, help me to humble myself. Help me to be so honest with myself that the moment I recognize iniquity in me, I just humble myself and say, Lord, that's not me. I, don't. I want the purest heart on the planet, because he blesses the pure in heart. And he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see me. And the Greek word, wow. Arab, Arab, Aramaic word, whatever, in the original language there, the pure heart, it, and shall see me. It's the Greek word, hoplus. And it does not mean see with your natural eyes. It means you see with single vision the glory of God. Wow. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see me. This is not saying when you get to heaven, it's on this earth. You will have spiritual eyes to perceive and discern the glory of God. Wow. And that's why Jesus said, I do nothing except I see my father doing it. He did only what his father's doing. I get invites every day to get involved with certain things in the kingdom, and I will not do anything anymore unless my father. I've, a big thing came recently, and I just waited and waited, and I thought, yo, this is good, and it's important, and I like that person. And the father just said, no, it's not, it's not for you to do. Say no. Because if you do anything that the father is not leading you into, you are in a place of danger. It is destruction because you've been led astray into busyness and you've missed what the Father wanted you to do. When you're in the glory, you become super, super, super sensitive that no human being is going to dominate you with the importance of something. You're going to do what your Father called you to do. Come on, Sam, now you're listening so well, I need to finish very quickly. You attract him by humility. You attract him because you're 
because he knows he is your great treasure and nothing competes with him. He's a jealous God. He actually says that many times. But his jealousy is not insecure. His jealousy is he loves you so much. He wants to possess you and have you uniquely and exclusively as his first love. He doesn't mind you having a second or third love. But he doesn't want you loving something more than him. Because he is God and we're not. So the glory means, it's gone 10 minutes, Sean. Anyway, the glory means, in the, in, in the Hebrew, it means the kabod. And it means the weightiness. It's the, 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 the more concentrated and the more dense and the more the glory pol- molecules. I don't know how to say it scientifically, so I'm just saying it in a clumsy, horrible, inadequate way. I've been in realms of the glory where the, it's so thick, you almost have to swim through it. It is so thick that even thick people fall under the power, the glory. It, when people don't have any revelation or discernment. There are realms of glory where the dullest person gets insights into heaven and what is. The glory is full of grace. Can you say amen? And the glory compacts and intensifies in density. And when it does that more and more through a hungry, humble people, all things are possible. The glory takes the church beyond the peripheral fence where you, you don't need to lay hands on people. People just get healed and set free in the glory. In the anointing, you've got to lay hands on people. Are you still with me? The glory takes racism out of us, superiority, self-righteousness. I earn and deserve the presence of the glory. It takes all of that. Come on. Amen. The glory is so weighty and so heavy because of the weightiness of God's goodness that God has to find, and this is now I'm quickly revising and finishing, God has to find the right furniture if he wants to come and sit down in the middle of a church, his full glory. I'm talking about his full glory. No one on this planet and for millennia has seen his full glory. But he's eager, for he says in the last days, the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And the glory of the latter house, the new covenant house, will be greater than the glory of the former house. And it says, in that place I will declare my peace and bring gold and silver and blessing in the glory. Why? Because he can trust wealth to people in the glory because they're not greedy. And they will not use it all on themselves. They will use it to build his house and his people. Come on, can you say amen? And so we had this, this is revision. We had this elder in our church in South Africa, a very big man. His name was Dave Lepolsky. He was Polish. I loved him like very few men I've loved. He was so honorable. He was about 20 years older than me. But Dave was big. We called him Big Dave. And when we brought him around for dinner in our house, every time he sat on any of our chairs in the dining room, within 10 seconds, you'd hear that horrific sound, wood cracking, and (laughs) boom, because the chair was not designed to hold his weight. And it happened three times. And we were so grieved because we thought, now we can't have this dear man come and have dinner in our house. And Glenda, being the practical one, said, well, let's just get reinforced chairs. <laughs> I thought, I, why didn't I think about that? So we got reinforced chairs. They were strong. And Dave came and ch- checked it, checked it. And then he could there, and then he could just bump on it. And then we could have fellowship with Dave for the rest of our life in South Africa. When God looks at a local church, he wants to come in his glory. But he needs to find furniture there that can hold the weight. Otherwise, it will be destroyed. Revival in Hong Kong in glory will destroy the city at the moment. Because there's no furniture except in a few places. Why did God's glory fade under the law? But in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle of Moses, over the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, the glory was fully dense. And there for 24 hours, 
all the time, every day, month after month, year after year. Why did the glory abide there in a place that only one person could go to once a year? Why? Because it was on the mercy seat. So they had the law, and they actually had the written stones of the law, and they put them in the box, and then they closed the lid. And they put gold and silver on the top of the lid and called it the mercy seat and had the cherubims, the arch, these archangels with hammered, hammered out by glory overarching. And on the top of that lid that hid the law, they put blood regularly. And once a year on the Day of Atonement, lots of blood. So that God, heard commas, could not see the law. All he could see was the blood and the mercy seat. So he came and sat down on that furniture and stayed there 24 hours a day for many, many years. But he's got something better than the Ark of the Covenant. It's called the New Covenant People. So we don't hide the law under a box anymore. Because many times... After the day of Pentecost, the new covenant says, you're dead to the law. You're redeemed from the curse of the law. Yeah. And, and, until believers come and they humble themselves and they go, that is, not, that is truly true. By revelation, I know there's absolutely no chance of the law condemning me or judging me or, or canceling my faith. There's no chance of that. See, that's why you've got to preach grace over and over and over and over again. Because people get it, then they lose it. They get it, then they lose it. How do they know they're losing it? The glory's not turning up in their life. They're not furniture he can sit on. Because if he sits on people who are self-righteous or under the law, or under condemnation, boom, their lives are, cr are smashed. Because the weight of the glory, we could not handle it unless we are a people free from the law. And we are operating with real faith in the goodness of God. We can speak on behalf of our God because we know his ways. We know his pattern. And we know his nature. And we know he'll never do the things Hong Kong people blame God for doing. And people all over the world blame him. He, he will never do and he'll never make people sick. He will, you can always speak on behalf of God with authority. Even if you don't know the Bible, it's something even better. You know the author of the Bible. Because it's the living word that comes from the spirit. That's really what changes your life. Can you say? Amen. And I believe that the whole purpose of, I, I could have, over 17 years, I could have preached a whole series on how to have a better marriage, how to be a better person, how to get rid of certain, you know, how to behave more, how to be more holy, how to be a good employee, how to relate to other. I mean, all these practical things are great, but human secular society learns that all the time. They go to courses on that. I don't want to compete with what unbelievers can do. I don't, I, when I go to a church, I want to know, did something happen there that you cannot explain by human ability? Yeah. Did something happen? Because if it didn't happen, what's the difference between an atheist group teaching how to have a better marriage, how to go into outer space, when they don't believe there's a creator of the heavens and the earth? They believe that we are the, we are the gods. I don't want to get into all the things atheists can teach so well. I believe that as I read the New Covenant and the Bible, the call of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers is to equip the people to do the ministry of Jesus and greater works. To so that the church comes to the full measure of the statue of Christ and is no longer tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine like little infants, but those who lay in, in cunning craftiness and deceitful scheming. Why would the Bible use such horrific words? Because Paul and the Spirit knew that Christians will they'll get drift off grace. And people say, well, what's so bad about that? Because then you lose your furniture. To have the glory. And when the glory comes with ever increasing dimensions, you go beyond the peripheral fence and now you stand out in the earth as a very distinctive people who are representing the living God. And then your shadow starts healing the sick. 
and your grumpy moods begin to evaporate and go away. Because David said, the glory is the lifter of my head. You get in the glory, your head lifts up. 